Cody Raw here with Tech for Psych. Today we're going to talk about physics and how we see the universe. It's a nice spring day in Washington, D.C., and there's a parade going on down in the street. And it so happens that the way that I see the world, the way that everybody down there sees the world, is shaped by education, the way that we were taught physics. And in this talk, we're going to talk about a underground debate between classical physics and quantum mechanic physics. And it has to do with the way that we see our connectedness to other people, other life forms, and the physical universe. It's nice right now, it's springtime. There's actually a parade happening down on the street. And it's interesting to think that my view of the world, everybody's view of the world in this current city is shaped by those beliefs. So there's an underground debate happening right now. And again, it has to do with the way that we understand physics. 300 years ago, Isaac Newton defined several laws, force equals mass times acceleration, the law of gravity. And the gist of it is that we are separate from the universe, that we are separated from physical objects. Like for example, if I hit this plant and have some kind of effect and another person comes along and hits it in the same way, the plant will respond in the same way. The plant is separate from me. Objects are separate from me. In a Darwinian sense, if I wasn't here, the universe would continue on without me. That is the classical Newtonian way of looking at things. But the interesting thing is that quantum mechanics on the subatomic scale suggests differently. Quantum mechanics suggests that matter doesn't actually exist until a conscious observer comes into it. And that matter is manifesting as we go along in a biocentric sort of view. Now biocentric means that central to the universe is biology, that life is actually central to the manifestation of the universe. Now quantum mechanics came around about a hundred years ago and a big champion for it was Niels Bohr. And this is around the time of Albert Einstein too and he had a lot of input on quantum mechanics. There were some weird experiments that weren't defined or weren't explainable by current physics, like the photoelectric effect. Basically, and I'll put links down below on the description of this video so you can take a look at these experiments more, but through the photoelectric effect, light, which we originally thought of as acting as waves, was actually acting as particles. And then later on, the slit lamp experiment, electrons that we originally thought were particles were acting like waves. Another weird thing about quantum mechanics is quantum entanglement, meaning that subatomic particles that got close to each other and separated from a long distance actually influenced each other on speeds faster than the speed of light, that somehow they were connected. Einstein called that spooky action at a distance. He didn't like it very much, and he actually, because it was defined by mathematics, didn't feel like the theory was correct, didn't feel like the theory actually was explaining the real world. Einstein passed away in 1955 and it was actually shown through an experiment later that the quantum entanglement theory was actually correct, that that was actually happening. I think one of the reasons why quantum theory has been underground until now is because it hasn't applied to biology yet. But within the last couple of years, there's some biological processes that have been shown to actually be reacting to quantum mechanical theories. The other thing to keep in mind is that physicists have been using quantum mechanics to describe subatomic particles in uh, transistors, microchips, basically all of our technology right now is running off of quantum mechanical properties. Now back again to the life form. So mathematics is most easily applied to physics. It gets a little bit more murky when you go to chemistry and it gets even more murky when you go to biology. But there's several biological processes that weren't really explainable until now by using classical physics in the Newtonian sense, but by using quantum mechanics, we can explain several things. For example, our smell, believe it or not, our smell follows quantum mechanical properties. If you have two molecules that have different structures, you would expect them to cause different smells, right? It'd be a lock and key mechanism. The structure of the molecule goes into the receptor, activates the smell, and it causes you to smell in a certain way. But what actually happens is that you can have two different chemical structures that are vibrating in the same way and cause the same smell. And that's a very quantum mechanical property. 
just recently was shown that plants, this little guy right here, is actually using quantum mechanics, that the light coming down and hitting the chlorophyll molecules is spreading out in a wave. The light is hitting an electron, excuse me, that is spreading out in a wave. And the electron only manifests when it actually gets to the correct area to cause a reaction that allows the plant to build sugar, which is what our entire ecosystem is built upon. It was always argued that birds followed the Earth's magnetic field. And the weird thing about that was that the Earth's magnetic field is so light, it's so uh, weak, that people were like, how on Earth could a bird actually sense that? And in birds, it's actually been recently shown that light enters their eye, creates a chemical reaction in a quantum mechanical way, and actually allows them to detect the magnetic field to navigate the Earth, allowing them to understand the difference between North and South. Believe it or not, enzymes within our bodies have also been shown to use quantum mechanics to speed up, speed up chemical reactions. Now the reason why I'm talking about quantum mechanics is because it can really shape your view of how the world is in relation to human beings. In the classical Newtonian sense, we, sense, we understand ourselves as separate from the universe, as individual objects that are going through space and time, collecting resources, and trying to get what we need in this life. Whereas the quantum mechanical view suggests that we're actually like creating our universe. That, And you get all kinds of metaphysical ideas from this. You get ideas that mind can actually affect matter, that you can get psychic abilities, all these weird things, these metaphysical levels above the subatomic descriptions, okay? The problem is people try to go from the subatomic level all the way up to current day and they probably run away with their theories a little bit. But again, if you consider the fact that we are made of subatomic particles and that quantum physics seems to be working out for us in terms of calculating how technology works to calculating how biology works, what does that mean about how we're connected to the universe? And I often think about self-development and the two different frameworks, right? So you can have the Newtonian framework and you can have the quantum mechanical framework. Newtonian framework I can explain pretty well by now. You can think of the brain as being this organ that gets you through time and space, right? So if you set goals, you activate your reticular activation system, which is looking for opportunities that you can capitalize on. Basically what happens is that it's kind of like when you want a new car, right? So let's say I want a Ford Mustang. I think of a Ford Mustang and then I see them all on the street as I'm driving. It's because my reticular activation system is looking for Ford Mustangs. In the same sense, when you define goals, you look for opportunities to capitalize on. And since you visualize your goals, you can actually get over fear because it reduces the amygdala, the fear activation center in the brain so that you can capitalize on that. When you do actually capitalize on it, it reduces fear, actually changes chemical instruct chemical expression within your body and allows you to uh, get wins and build receptors within your brain that make you more likely to be smarter, more on point, more fearless in getting what it is that you want. So I had to finish this video on a different day because it got so loud in the streets that it completely wrecked the audio. But where I was going with that is that you can describe self-development in a Newtonian sense and it's safe there because you can describe it in a scientific way, a way that would hold up in scientific communities because you can reduce things to their parts and make pretty accurate uh, predictions on how things play out. But with, with uh, quantum mechanics on the subatomic scale where people get into trouble is they try to take the weird stuff that's happening on the very, very small scale and try to blow it up and try to explain what's happening in our everyday lives. And I think the epitome of that is the law of attraction. Um, maybe you've seen that 2006 video called The Secret that talked about the law of attraction and how the universe responds to the thoughts that we hold in our heads. And to me, that's really taking quantum mechanics on a subatomic scale and blowing it up to our everyday lives, thinking that because it's a biocentric universe, that because the universe doesn't exist unless we come into it, that it's responding to us somehow. Now, you really get into trouble with that when you talk about that in scientific communities because you can't really prove it scientifically. So basically, what my hope is is that one day science will be able to bridge the gap between uh, what we see on the subatomic scale and what we see on the everyday scale. 
And I'll have to say that the law of attraction really feels good because it makes you feel like you're connected to the universe, connected to the other people, that the universe is really responding to your hopes, dreams, and desires, and that if you just take action, it will manifest for you. But again, you have to be careful when you talk about that kind of stuff in scientific circles because it doesn't hold up to scientific rigor at this point. And again, hopefully one day we'll get there where if not the science that we have today, maybe a different method of philosophy that we have in the future, we'll be able to make accurate predictions and hold up to logic on why exactly that happens and if it's true and how our relationship to the universe actually is. So I'll leave it at that for now. If you have any questions about this, just leave them in the comments below. It's Cody Rall, Tech for Psych. Please support the brain games. I'll talk to you next time. Hey, it's Cody Rall with Tech for Psych coming to you from the Potomac, Washington DC waterfront. And what I've noticed in the past two years of doing this is that you, the viewer, really wants to get involved with neurotechnology, but you don't necessarily have means of doing so. Now I'm gonna tell you how you can do that in just a second, but first I just wanna thank you for being a part of this community. It's a group of people that are interested in uh, self-development by using principles in neuroscience and innovations in neurotechnology, and it's been a great ride so far. Now let me tell you about the brain games. We here at Tech for Psych wanna put on a competition in which mind athletes come together from around the country and compete in different cognitive domains to include meditation, using biofeedback, memorization, uh, control of robotic limbs and drones by using brain-computer interface and decision-making skills. Now the mind athletes that win each category are going to be recognized nationally, win prizes, and get to work with neurotechnology companies to help develop their products. In addition, mind athletes can agree to undergo brain scans and other studies in an effort to democratize their cognitive strategies for the population. Now if you're interested in supporting the Brain Games or entering as a mind athlete, subscribe to the channel here and take a look at www.techforsych.com. Subscribe to the email list. We'll keep you updates on the Kickstarter campaign where we will consider certain donation amounts as automatic entry fees to be a mind athlete if you want to do so. Uh, again, subscribe to the channel. Take a look at the website. The more people that we have on board, the better that we're able to talk to academic institutions, financial backers, and neurotechnology companies to help make the Brain Games a reality. It's Cody Roll with Tech for Psych. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you next time soon.